I'm John Strum, and this is Real Talk MS. It's July 20th, and we have a lot to talk about. And I want to get started by reminding you that this Thursday, July 22nd, is World Brain Day. Each year, the World Federation of Neurology highlights a particular neurological condition, and the theme of World Brain Day 2021 is Stop Multiple Sclerosis. If you'd like to learn more about World Brain Day, check out some of the excellent videos on their website or register for the webinar that's going to take place on July 22nd. You'll find a link in today's show notes. And while we're talking about things that are happening over the next couple of days, I'm going to be on the other side of the interview tomorrow, July 21st at 5 p.m. Eastern Time, when I'll be the guest on eSupport Health's Wednesday Workshop. I'm looking forward to this live conversation with the co-founder and CEO of eSupport Health, Dr. Victoria Levitt. Now, we haven't set anything up in advance, but Dr. Levitt's social media posts hint at a pretty wide-ranging conversation. The event is live, it won't be recorded, and it would be great to have the Real Talk MS listener community represented. So, I hope you'll join us. If you'd like to register to virtually attend tomorrow's free eSupport Health Wednesday workshop, you'll find a link in today's show notes. We're already into the second half of July, which means we're heading toward the second half of summer. And summertime traditionally means getting outside, enjoying outdoor activities, and being active. But if you're living with MS, outdoor activity and summertime temperatures can raise red flags when it comes to your day-to-day quality of life. It doesn't have to be that way. My guest today is Dr. Colin Lennington, an occupational therapist and clinical specialist at the VA Long Beach Healthcare System. Dr. Lennington is also the program lead for the Adaptive Sports and Home Access and Safety programs at the Long Beach VA, And we're talking about getting out of the house, staying safe, and keeping cool while you enjoy your summer activities. But before we get to my conversation with Dr. Colin Lennington, there are a few other things that you should know about. One of the greatest challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic is that we've been forced to learn about it in real time. And one of the things that we're learning is that some people who are receiving anti-CD20 monoclonal infusions like Ocrevus and Rituxan are not generating sufficient numbers of antibodies after receiving their COVID-19 vaccination. We're also learning that these same folks seem to have adequate T-cells post-vaccination, but experts don't yet know whether those T-cells will produce sufficient protection against COVID-19. So, what do you do? Reviewing the guidance issued by the National MS Society's COVID Vaccine Guidance Task Force, well, the guidance is pretty clear, and I want to quote directly now. If you are about to start Ocrevus or Rituxan, consider getting fully vaccinated two to four weeks or more prior to starting the infusions. If you are already taking Ocrevus or Rituxan, consider getting vaccinated 12 weeks or more after the last DMT dose. When possible, resume Ocrevus or Rituxan four weeks or more after getting fully vaccinated. This suggested scheduling is not always possible, and getting the vaccine may be more important than timing the vaccine with your MS medicine. Work with your MS healthcare provider to determine the best schedule for you. If you're already on Ocrevus or Rituxan, what happens when you delay your next infusion after being vaccinated? Well, a research team in Germany investigated that question by observing 318 people with relapsing remitting MS in five different centers across Germany. 116 of the study participants received Ocrevus on an extended dosing schedule somewhere between 5 and 13 weeks later than the normal dosing schedule would have allowed. And 182 of the study participants received their Ocrevus infusion per the regular schedule. 
Now, all of the study participants received neurological exams, including MRI scans, and the research team concluded that delaying the Ocrevus infusion during the COVID-19 pandemic did not present a risk of disease activity to people with relapsing remitting MS. If you're thinking about extending the interval between your COVID-19 vaccination and your next scheduled Ocrevus or Rituxan infusion, I hope you'll take the advice of the MS Society's COVID Vaccine Guidance Task Force and work with your MS healthcare provider to determine the best schedule for you. If you'd like to check the evidence and review the results of this study, you'll find a link in today's show notes. While we're looking at evidence that can impact treatment decisions, another study that analyzed the outcomes of people living with MS who underwent autologous hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, or AHSCT, has shown some encouraging results. The study looked at 120 people who underwent AHSCT between 2012 and 2019 at two centers in London. 52% of these people had either primary or secondary progressive MS, and 48% had relapsing remitting MS. And of these 120 people, 108 had shown MRI activity in the 12 months before they received the stem cell treatment. Analysis of the outcomes for these 120 people indicate that 93% were relapse-free after two years, and 87% were relapse-free four years following AHSCT. 85% of the group had no new MRI lesions four years after treatment. 75% experienced no increase in their EDSS score after two years, and 65% experienced no increase in their EDSS score after four years. There were three transplant-related deaths within 100 days of AHSCT, all following fluid overload and cardiac or respiratory failure. Now, because these numbers reflect people with progressive and relapsing remitting MS, some finer detail would be helpful here, but these real-world results remain very encouraging. If you'd like to review the details of this study, you'll find a link in today's show notes. A significant challenge to treating MS and other neurological disorders is finding ways to get medicines to the central nervous system, which requires crossing the blood-brain barrier, a network of blood vessels and tissues that prevent foreign substances from reaching the brain. So this past week, it was encouraging to hear about the initial success that biopharmaceutical company BioAsis Technology achieved in a study that used their proprietary platform to deliver an anti-inflammatory molecule to the central nervous system in the mouse model of MS. It's important to remember that there are huge differences between a mouse brain and a human brain. However, a step forward is always encouraging news. And the ability of BioAsis' proprietary XB3 peptide platform to serve as a reliable transport mechanism that can potentially deliver anti-inflammatory agents and other large molecule biologics across the blood-brain barrier is very good news. If you'd like to review the BioAsis announcement of this initial success, you'll find a link in today's show notes. We often hear from experts that early treatment with disease-modifying therapies leads to better outcomes, better quality of life for people living with MS. And study results from researchers at the Oklahoma University Health Sciences Center and the Oklahoma City Veterans Affairs Medical Center underscore the fact that it's not just beginning treatment with a DMT, but adhering to that treatment that can make a real difference. The research team reviewed the electronic records of 279 veterans with MS and found that they fit into one of three different patient groups that were defined by each veteran's adherence to their disease-modifying therapy. They classified one group as adherent, one group as poorly adherent, and one group as non-adherent. 
and over time they discovered that the veterans who adhered to their disease-modifying therapies had less decline in MS-related cognition, disease severity, and disability. Now that outcome bears repeating. Less decline in MS-related cognition, disease severity, and disability. And if you're living with MS, I'd consider those three characteristics to be three primary determinants when it comes to assessing quality of life. If you'd like to review the details of this study, you'll find a link in today's show notes. I've always believed that part of the formula for determining or evaluating your quality of life ought to include how you spend your time. In the summer, that often means participating in sports, doing some gardening, and this year when long-distance travel can still seem kind of dicey, maybe taking day trips to destinations that are closer to home. But if you're living with MS, all of those outdoor activities present challenges. Even the weather itself can be challenging. My guest today is Dr. Colin Lennington, and we're talking about how to overcome those challenges and safely pursue those summertime activities. In a moment, we'll meet my guest, Dr. Colin Lennington. Summer can be the perfect season to travel. However, health issues, safety concerns, and limitations caused by the pandemic may mean more of us will be staying close to home this year. Today, we're talking about having fun close to home while staying safe and staying cool. Joining me is Dr. Colin Lennington, an occupational therapist and clinical specialist at the VA Long Beach Healthcare System within the Spinal Cord Injury and Disorders System of Care. Dr. Lennington provides clinical care for veterans with neurological conditions, including spinal cord injury, multiple sclerosis, and ALS in inpatient, outpatient, and acute rehabilitation settings, as well as in the wheelchair seating clinic and assistive technology lab. Dr. Lennington is also the program lead for the Adaptive Sports and Home Access and Safety Programs. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Lennington. Thank you so much for having me, John. It's a pleasure to be here. Staying home means you may have more time to find a new hobby or try an activity you haven't tried before. What are some leisure activities people can explore from home, and are there easy ways to get started in them? It's a great question, and I think Truthfully, the sky's the limit. If there's something you want to try, I, I recommend everyone just going out there and uh, and participating. But I know taking those first couple steps can be really challenging. So as far as kind of brainstorming things that people commonly like to participate in, I think art is a really big one. Um, I think art is one of those things that sometimes we do when we're younger and then we kind of lose it as we grow. But I, I would highly encourage people to tap back into that, uh, whether it's painting or photography or drawing, it could even be something that's digital artwork. Um, it's sometimes more accessible for people. You know, I think a lot of the people I work with also enjoy doing just online classes or online programs, uh, as well as potentially, you know, learning a new language, uh, making jewelry, doing something that expands kind of the repertoire of things and it can also be productive. I, I have people that have told me that, you know, they start doing these things inside and then they, they made all of their holiday presents and they're good to go. So it really uh, can be beneficial in multiple ways. You know, I'm glad you mentioned so many of those things that can be done inside because during the summer, there are days when it's really too hot to be outside, and these sound like the perfect activities that you can continue pursuing regardless of the weather. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah, you can really do these things. I was, I was thinking particularly of things inside. That's correct. Well, if someone is thinking about getting outdoors and maybe taking a day trip, how do they best plan and prepare for it? Are, are there specific questions they should be asking before visiting a particular destination or venue? Absolutely. I think I, I always recommend doing your research ahead of time. It's so critical to having success and successful um, participation. You know, I, I would strongly encourage people to go to the website of the place they're, they're planning to go. Hopefully there's pictures of the, of the environment if not, I, I highly encourage people to use you know, Google or some other search engine, hopefully something like Google Photos where you can, or Google Images, so you can kind of see 
the area. You can map around. You can figure out what's going on. And obviously, calling ahead to ask specific questions. If you know there's something particular that it's going to make it more accessible for you or just have a better time for you, that's something that's really important. Um, and I would caution people, you know, a lot of, I think a lot of places will kind of sit on, well, it's ADA accessible. And, and that's great. But just as a, as a quick kind of caution, you know, ADA is a minimum guideline. It's not, it just doesn't necessarily mean accessible for all. And so you know what you need to be successful and uh, to have a safe, you know, outing. So, you know, ask the specific questions. If you need a bathroom set up a certain way, if you need a ramp a certain way, if you need a, a rail, you know, just, just ask the question. Exercise and physical activity can both benefit, well, really everyone. And they've been shown to be a real benefit to people living with MS. Sometimes an accommodation can make a particular activity really easy and so much more enjoyable. Can you tell us about adaptive sports and recreational activities? Sure. Uh, adaptive sports and recreational activities, um, it's a very near and dear to my heart, obviously. Uh, you know, As a whole, it's basically anything that someone with a disability participates in as far as adaptive sports and rec. That could be physical, cognitive, sensory. And really, you know, that adaptive sport basically means that you have a sport and it's adapted to, uh, or modified to meet the needs of that person so they can participate and participate in a way that's meaningful for them. And so, you know, it could be something um, as simple as, you know, adding bumpers to a bowling lane, uh, or it could be something as kind of all the way on the other end of the spectrum of I've had veterans who uh, participate in snow skis uh, that are power operated, you know, through uh, a, a mouse stick that's controlled with, you know, in order to operate them. And so it's really just the whole gamut. And so, you know, finding the, the pairing of that adaptive equipment that allows you to do what you want to do is, is so critical. And so, you know, whether you have a, a seated activity or a seated sport, you know, a lot of sports um, can be modified for wheelchairs, whether that's wheelchair basketball or wheelchair rugby, baseball, uh, or you have something that's just modified in terms of the, the general rules or allowances. A lot of times it's not necessarily the equipment, but it's just what's allowed or what's acceptable as far as the rules um, can make a change. And so that's, that's another example. I will also say there are adaptive sports that are created purely for people with disabilities. Um, goal ball being an example, it's not something that exists, you know, for people without disabilities. And so it's just a really wide gamut of what's out there. And so if there's a sport that you're interested in that you tried before, or that's you would want to do, I would highly encourage you to, to, uh, to check it out because there's probably something that can be done that you can um, let you participate. And it's not just sports. It can be adapted. Gardening is another activity that a lot of people living with MS enjoy. Can you tell us about the benefits of adaptive gardening and explain what some of those adaptations might be? Sure. I mean, gardening um, is just one of those activities that I think a lot of people really enjoy, as you mentioned. And so, and there are a lot of benefits to it. Research has shown it can be calming, relaxing, there's a meditative quality, but it, it can also be physically challenging. Uh, but as you, as you noted, physical activity by itself can also be really beneficial for so many reasons. Um, we know about all the aerobic and anaerobic benefits but you know, to make it adapted, as an occupational therapist, we lean heavily on planning ahead, and we use um, what we call energy um, conservation management. So, making sure you're doing the things you know at, that are going to be more challenging, possibly at cooler times of the day, or when you have more energy. Breaking things down into smaller tasks, of course, are always going to be helpful. For for gardening specifically, I think that. One of the ones that's most common is using a, a raised bed or a potted plant, something where you don't have to get all the way down on the ground. It makes it a lot easier to participate and do what you want to do. Having plants that require less upkeep can be helpful too, because you just have to go out there quite as often. Uh, using tools that are less heavy can be really helpful. Um, a lot of people find that they have decreased grip strength um, or hand strength. So using something that has a, a wider or bigger handle can be really helpful. Doing something like 
you know, wrapping duct tape around a handle to make it thicker or using one of those pool noodles can be helpful. Those are all things that can just make it a little bit easier to participate and not stress your body as much. If we're talking about summertime activities, then we have to talk about heat. And we know that heat and MS don't mix well. Why does heat often exacerbate MS symptoms? That's an excellent question. And so, you know, what research has shown is that even a quarter to a half degree increase in heat can really affect the body. Uh, you know, thinking about MS, we know about how, you know, you have the demyelate, demyelination uh, of the neurons and the axons. And so, you know, what happens there is basically the heat slows that signal even more. And so that's what causes those kind of pseudo exacerbations for, for people. Um, and, you know, that's kind of the biggest thing there. And I apologize, John, was there a second part of your question there as far as what you're asking? No, that, that was, that okay. was perfect. But, but, but I'll add a second part now, since you brought it up, Sure. Well, what, what type of changes uh, or symptoms might people experience? Should they overheat? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah. I mean, it's so, it can be so individual. Uh, you know, MS is such an individual disease. It can affect everyone so differently, but you know, these kind of pseudo exacerbations, um, I would say can tend to look similar to how a typical exacerbation might look for someone. It could have, uh, you know, someone could have fatigue, weakness, kind of this vertigo overall, not feeling well, dehydration, blurred vision, you know, you name it, anything that makes you feel off your game, so to speak could be this kind of exacerbation experience caused by the heat. Now, an actual MS exacerbation might last for days. Uh, how long do these kinds of changes typically last? Well, thankfully, they don't last very long. Typically, you know, once you get that core body temp back down to, you know, your normal range, um, the exacerbations, these pseudo exacerbations, I should say, start to go away. You know, once you get inside, hopefully if you're outside, if you drink cool water, you're in the air conditioning, whatever you're doing to get your core body temp back down, uh, you should see your symptoms starting to resolve uh, fairly quickly. If, if they don't start resolving fairly quickly, that would be an indication that you probably should seek more medical attention, either from your neurologist or from your medical team. But yeah, I mean, basically, once you get out of the heat or once you cool your body temp down, and obviously you can check that with a thermometer, you can check that. Um, you know, with a temporal scan, you can, you should start to see changes. One way to proactively offset the heat is by using a cooling product, like a cooling vest, for instance. Can you tell us a, about how cooling vests work and where people can find them? Sure. Uh, cooling vests, you know, basically act as a modality, we would call it, as far as occupational therapists are concerned. And what it does is it applies, obviously, cool temperature to the external part of your body, and that permeates you, and it helps reduce your core body temp. And so the same way an ice pack would. And so what's nice about cooling vests is usually they're, they're gel-based in terms of what the inserts are, um, and they you know, fit over you and wrap, wrap your basically the core of your body so, to reduce your temperature. And so they can be really helpful. Um, there's also cooling uh, products that you can place at other pressure points, you know, behind your neck, at your wrists, behind your knees, or other areas that can be helpful for placing cooling products. As far as purchasing them, um, you know, you can obviously go to like a medical supply store or look online at a medical supply company. But to tell you the truth, you know, I've had most success uh, places like Amazon, other online stores. You know, make sure you look at the descriptions, make sure you look at the sizes, make sure you uh, understand kind of the weight. Sometimes cooling vests can be quite heavy given what they're made out of. So make sure you know uh, what you're purchasing, but there's a lot of options out there. Well, Dr. Colin Lennington, thank you for all you do to improve the well-being of people living with MS. And thanks for talking with me today. You're very welcome, John. A pleasure to be here. That's going to wrap up this episode of Real Talk MS. Real Talk MS is powered by the National MS Society. And you can share this episode of the podcast by letting your friends or family members know that all they have to do is point their web browser at realtalkms.com slash 203. You'll find that link in today's show notes so you can easily copy and paste it right into an email or text. 
I hope you'll check out the eSupport Health Wednesday workshop tomorrow, July 21st at 5 p.m. Eastern Time, when I'll be on the other side of the interview in what I know will be a lively conversation with eSupport Health co-founder and CEO, Dr. Victoria Levitt. You'll find the link to register for this free event in today's show notes. I'm John Strun. Thanks for listening. Stay safe and make healthy choices.